Because isn't it that you get borderline people that they will, let's say, their fantasy object will be a celebrity, will be a, a man they haven't even met. So there's no question, there's no hope, well, maybe there's a tiny bit of hope, but there's no realistic hope that that person is going to uh, be their real life friend that's going to regulate their emotions for them. So couldn't it be that the, 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 fa the fantasizing about somebody who's perfect and wonderful is going to make their life great, is, is this living in a fantasy, that is a way of coping with the negative feelings. Before fantasy is a critical feature of narcissism and of, and of borderline. <clears throat> But these are different types of fantasies. It is the narcissist who believes himself unconsciously to be bad, unworthy, inadequate, and needs to compensate for this by pretending to be godlike. So, and he can do this only in a fantastic space, obviously. Yeah, so he needs he needs to resort to fantasy because reality would push back. Reality wouldn't allow him to maintain his self-delusion as godlike. This is the narcissist. The borderline is exactly the opposite. The borderline believes herself to be a good object. She believes herself to be perfection reified. She, but she realizes that she is not in control of her emotions and moods, and this makes her act out. It makes her misbehave. This lack of regulation makes her misbehave, causes her to misbehave. So she wants to get rid of this feature. It's, it's a bug. As far as she's concerned, it's a bug, not a feature. And she wants to get rid of it, debug, debug herself. And this she can do only through the agency of someone who is godlike, someone who is ideal, someone who, who she could feel is a secure base, someone she could hand over uh, control mm. over herself to. But nobody is that. So she she is she is simply focusing on all of the good sides of this person and ignoring the bad sides, which or, is or, or totally inventing things, yeah. But that's a, that's, a, that's itself a that's itself a fancy. That's my point. So what 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 is it that causes her then? So the, the, my understanding is that in these relationships, she'll have this fantasy object, and then as the relationship progresses between the whatever kind of man ends up in in the relationship with the borderline woman, we can look at that in a minute. Um, and um, and her then then you have the de de idealization. Um, so why does that process take place? Because of engulfment anxiety, when the partner reacts favorably to his new role as the godlike regulator of her emotions and moods, the guru, the teacher, the father figure, I don't know what, when he reacts favorably to that, he begins to be loving and caring, to display empathy and compassion and concern and, and so on and so forth. The borderline feels suffocated. She feels as though she is being held hostage. She feels imprisoned, shackled, inca incarcerated. She needs to run away. She feels consumed. She feels subsumed in him. She reacts very badly to what is known as the symbiotic state or merger and fusion. And then she begins to devalue the, the intimate partner or the special friend. And she transforms uh, the intimate partner into a persecutory object, into an enemy, basically, an internalized enemy. And she says, he's very controlling. He, he doesn't let me live my life. He is all over me. He doesn't let me have a minute to my own, of my own. I mean, I don't have my private time, private space. I need to get away. And she runs away. And she runs away hatefully. She becomes, as I said, hateful, rejecting, abusive, and so on and so forth. Just to ascertain that there will be no, no reenactment of the engulfment phase. To get rid of him permanently. <laughs> but then she regrets it because she has abandonment anxiety. Mm. She has brought on her, her abandonment, mm -hmm. it's preemptive abandonment. She created the very abandonment that she's terrified of. So then she hoovers. She goes back to the same intimate partner that she has just reviled. And she says, you, you've, you're actually the best. You're wonderful. And she re-idealizes him. And mm -hmm. this is an endless cycle. She can do this like 200 times. Mm. But what about, but what about if, if I was thinking that if, if you if you you idealize a person and you f and you basically farm out your emotional regulation to that person, then it's almost a um, how can I put it a, a narcissistic kind of idea not a narcissist that's not the wrong word almost solipsistic idea that 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 person understands you, and therefore if that person um, upsets you, that's his fault because he must have known. Um, that's and then, one, that's and therefore you, you go mad at him. It's all his fault. That's one aspect of it. Whenever, of course, the, the intimate partner deviates or diverges from the idealized image, uh, then, of course, this creates frustration and aggression. So the intimate partner should never deviate or diverge or contradict 
the idealized image of him in the borderline's mind. And if he ever does, it's cause for aggression. But that doesn't lead the borderline to abandon the intimate partner. The borderline actually abandons the intimate partner when he does conform to the idealized image. There's no winning with the borderline. If you conform with the idealized image, then she experiences engulfment anxiety, enmeshment anxiety, and she runs away. If you don't conform with the idealized image, then you're the enemy, and she devalues you, and she sticks around, but she begins to misbehave, act out, drama, uh, betrayal, and so on and so forth. So there's no winning strategy with the borderline. Are you ready for the future of the West? <laughs>